All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started in our first online virtual lecture. Um, this is the lecture number 25 that I presented to the class on Friday, where attendance was not mandatory. So I told you I would recreate this uh, lecture with a video. Um, it should have all the same content. Hopefully, it all goes smoothly. I'm still adjusting to drawing on an iPad, but I think it's fairly clear. Um, I think it should work out pretty well. Um, so last last class, we, we found out that you know some of these changes would be taking place. We're transitioning to a new online format. Um, so I'm sure, as you know, all of your classes will now be online. Um, I posted problem set four. I'll be uploading some instructions on how these will be submitted. We'll be using a, a new program called Gradescope for submissions. Um, this will entail scanning or taking pictures of documents. Um, a follow-up email will provide more information on how to do this and the options available. Um, we've had some different questions regarding uh, times to turn things in or how exams will be handled, and that'll also be uh, discussed next week um, along with some emails on making the transition to an online format. Um, so right now I'm recording this lecture. If you found it, then presumably you see that we're going to have a series of YouTube links for each video. They are kind of broken up into hopefully some different conceptual sections so you can kind of watch different parts at a time. Um, I think that should help out. And the idea is to hopefully watch these lectures before class. We can use class time to answer questions, either do some more practice problems, or just generally uh, work through some things that weren't clear. Um, we'll also talk about how to take exams in the future. Um, we're still seeing how this will work out with different time zones, uh, but we should be able to have hopefully a more generous time allotted for so that, that you can account for having some time to print or upload the files into the system. As far as the chemistry goes, uh, last time we talked about a number of things. We talked about how you can make amides in a variety of different ways. Some of these ways were not particularly useful. So if you just add an amine and a carboxylic acid, such as drawn here, it'll make a salt. And if you just heat them up a whole lot, eventually you can make amides. Um, it is worth noting that this is not a general process. So this is not something you'll want to really be using. Um, it's not useful for most of the molecules that you'll have to make because of the side reactions that can take place. Instead, what we did learn is something that's much milder. It uses carbodiimides to perform the coupling. So a general carbodiimide is shown on the screen. That's the central functional group here where we have a nitrogen double bonded to a carbon that is also double bonded to a nitrogen. In this case, the reagent is called DCC, dicyclohexyl carbodiimide. And this is pretty nice because this allows us to, at room temperature, take a carboxylic acid, take an amine, you heat them. You don't need any heat in this case. You just add the reagent, and magically, this amide bond forms. So overall, we're losing water. So this is a dehydration formally. And in the end, this DCC will be turned into the corresponding urea. So this is another functional group that we'll be talking about a bit more today. And we'll even learn some other ways to synthesize them. Other methods we learned were dehydrating primary amides to nitriles with P2O5. We saw that P2O5 is actually P4O10. So it's a large structure. We had an abbreviated structure we used for the mechanism. But the general idea is that this nucleophilic oxygen on the amide carbonyl is able to attack one of these electrophilic phosphorus groups to make a good leaving group and eventually lose water and make a corresponding phosphoric acid and the nitrile. In the last section, we learned uh, a variety of new reactions for additions to uh, of organometal reagents and reductions of acid chlorides. Uh, most of this follows similar lines that we've learned before with esters, where you'll do over-reduction all the way to a primary alcohol. There was one new reagent we learned. It's this very bulky tert-butoxy aluminum and hydride. So we see we have three tert-butoxide groups around the aluminum. They're all very hindered. After the first addition of the hydride to the carbonyl and loss of chloride, we end up making an aldehyde. And this aldehyde will go and continue to react with the byproduct aluminum species that has three tert butyls on it. 
Let me make that look a little nicer. This has an empty p orbital, so it's able to coordinate to the carbonyl, and it makes a stable complex. And this stable complex that forms kind of protects the aldehyde from further attack. Even though it's electrophilically activated, there aren't any hydride groups on the aluminum to further react since these are all just turbutoxies. So this, in a sense, is another way of protecting the aldehyde from overreduction after the fact. And at the very end of class, we saw one new question where we were thinking about how can we use some of these ideas from last class in order to execute a synthesis. So this is proposing a synthesis of 2-methyl-2-hexanol from pentanoic acid. So first we need to draw what pentanoic acid looks like. We have 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, and 5 carbons. Put an acid at the end. And we're going to execute some number of steps to get us finally over to a tertiary alcohol that has two methyl groups on it. So in looking at this conversion, there's a couple things we can note. Um, overall, we have actually added two new methyls. Overall, we have added two new methyls to the program. So an important part to notice is that there are two new methyl groups that have been introduced to the molecule. So this is two new carbon atoms we need to add in. The other thing to note is that we have these two methyls that are added at the same time to a single carbon to make a tertiary alcohol. And so this is going to be a signature for addition to a carboxylic acid derivative. So we already start with a carboxylic acid derivative. It's a carboxylic acid. but We don't have a good leaving group on this OH. So we need to turn this into a good leaving group. So there's a number of ways that we should be able to do this. Um, one method that we have seen in, in class from previously to turn it into a good leaving group, and probably the best leaving group we have, is to turn it into an acid chloride. So this means we can use thionyl chloride, SOCl2. This is the same reagent we use to convert alcohols to alkyl chlorides. So it also allows us to turn a carboxylic acid derivative into an acid chloride. Then to finally go and give us the final product, all we need to do is add an organometal reagent with a methyl. So this could be methyl magnesium bromide. It could also be methyl lithium. And then after a workup with acid, we'll be able to generate the product. Alternatively, you could have done the same thing by converting this into a methyl ester and perform the same addition. Both of these answers would be equally correct. And once again, we would be using the same methyl magnesium bromide followed by workup to get there. To go from a carboxylic acid to an ester, there's a variety of ways we could do this. We could use catalytic H2, SO4, and methanol. So we have a large excess of methanol to perform the Fischer esterification. Or you could just add in a base. It could be something like sodium hydride to deprotonate the acid along with methyl iodide as your electrophile. So any of these answers would be perfectly suitable.